your screen. My entire screen. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Two separate research papers. Yeah, everybody wants to dump on y'all right at the end. Okay, so we're starting a new chapter today. Um, I will put this out in modules, but I'm going to just set the due date for your next three parts of your project problem for Friday. You can turn it in early if you want to. Um, I guess those due dates were kind of, you know, turning them in is I can check them, but it's really just kind of a timeline for you just to keep you on track, I guess. So just know that the whole project's due before you leave for the holiday. And um, it has to be turned in on paper, the original. I don't want copies or scans or pictures of it. I want the problem turned in. So um, anything else is not going to be accepted. So um, unless you have some kind of extreme circumstances that you can justify. Like you have tuberculosis and you can't be around people. I'm not really expecting that to. Perfect. Well, if you catch it late before you go next week, if you catch it late over the weekend or something. Yeah. I think so. Most of the guys don't have an excuse, so I'm not too worried about that. Okay. So chapter 10 is on fixed assets and depreciation. I told y'all we would um, learn to calculate depreciation. That so far they had just given us the numbers. Mm -hmm. Um. Some of the stuff in the very beginning is review. Fixed assets, also known as plant assets or property plant and equipment. Those are long-term, relatively permanent assets like equipment, machinery, buildings, and land. Although we don't depreciate land, it's still a fixed asset. So some of the characteristics, they exist physically. They are tangible, meaning we can touch them. Uh, they are owned and used by the company in normal operations. So they're not being held for investment to sell and make money. They are being held to use to make money in the business for operations. And then they're not offered as sale for sale rather as part of operations. So it's not something that's um, a product or something like that. It's something they're using to maybe make the product. Okay. So this is a, an exhibit out of your book and it just kind of tells for each different category of asset what some of the costs might be related to acquiring these assets like land you have the purchase price obviously but you're gonna have other things involved in buying land that would be considered part of the cost like Closing costs, when you have to have an attorney go through and draw up the paperwork you need to transfer the ownership and all that kind of stuff. If you're paying a, um, a real estate agent, commissions, anything that you have to pay, anything you have to pay to get that asset. And when it comes to machinery and equipment, buildings and things, anything you have to pay to get that asset in working order and ready to uh, use in operations. So for a building, it could be, electricity, um, well, that's no brainer. I'm thinking about equipment. Um, if you're building a brand new building, it's pretty much going to be everything that goes into it. Architects fees, um, insurance while it's being built, um, cost of any materials that are going into it, any of that kind of stuff. If you're having to renovate it to use it, then all those costs will be part of it. Uh, for machinery and equipment, if you have to pay for freight to get it to your place of business so that you can put it into operations, and we kind of learned that with inventory, freight just kind of goes into the cost of it. If you have to have an electrician come and set up special wiring and get this machinery up and going, that wiring and stuff is part of the cost of it. So there's a lot of things that go into the cost that more than just the purchase price. All right, so um, assets, initial cost, purchase price and all the costs to obtain and get it ready for use. That's kind of what we just talked about. So an asset's expected useful life, that's the estimated length of time that this asset will be used in normal operations. So um, a lot of that's kind of established 
with GAAP. Um, certain classes of assets have certain lines. I think we've talked about that before. Um, and it's their typical estimated expected useful life. How long will you be able to use this asset? Um, an asset's residual value. That's something that we're going to see when we're calculating depreciation. And it's the, um, what do you think this asset's going to be worth at the end of its useful life? Will it have any value left? That's what residual is. So when we're trying to determine how much we're going to depreciate, we'll take the cost of the asset, subtract that residual value, and then the rest of it will depreciate. There's three different methods we're going to look at. Straight line, units of activity, and double declining balance. Okay, so for straight line depreciation, you're going to have the same amount of depreciation every year. It's the same thing. That's why it's called straight line. You um, take the cost of the asset minus its residual value, and you divide it by the number of years or months or whatever that you expect that asset to be useful. So... Um, you can make that into a percentage by dividing 100% by the number of years you expect that asset to be useful. All right, and that's with straight line. Okay, so our first example we're looking at here is a building acquired at the beginning of the year. So that means they bought a building at the beginning of the year. The cost of it was 950. Has an estimated residual value of 150 and it's expected to be useful for 20 years. So we've got to figure out the following items. So depreciable cost. I said we would get that by taking our cost minus our residual value. And again, residual value is what's it gonna be worth when you're, it's outlived its usefulness for your purposes. So that's gonna give us the amount that we're going to depreciate or our depreciable cost. This is the amount that we will use for depreciation calculations, 800000 So the straight line rate will take our, are we getting the, the rate we're getting using the um, percentage? So 100% divided by 20 gives you what? 5%? No. Oh, there we go, the straight line rate. What's the... So the rate is... Yeah, the rate's the percentage, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So if we take 100% divided by 20, 20 years, What's the rate? Yeah. 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 What? 0 0.05 or 5%. Five All right, so then our annual depreciation will be 800,000 times 5% or 40,000? Or we could also say 950 minus 150 divided by 20. And that should give us the same thing. Does that give us the same thing? Yep. Okay, so that's what, that's what we're doing. First, this right here, we're just saying, okay, we're going to calculate how, what percent we're going to take of depreciation every year. So you can see by getting this uh, depreciable cost, using the percentage, we get the same amount as taking our cost minus residual divided by the number of years. So that's just two different ways to calculate the same number, whichever one makes more sense to you. Okay, so here's a you work this one. Um, so depreciable cost, how will we get that? Looking at that last one. Subtract the residual value from the, the cost of the equipment or building. Yeah. So we're going to take 
our original cost or our purchase price, we're going to subtract out that residual value amount and we get 250. Okay, so we're trying to figure out what rate we're going to use. We would take our 100%, um, which would be all of the depreciation, and we would divide it by the number of years, which is 10. So we're going to take 10% interest every year, right? So what we could do is multiply that 250 times 10 percent and that'll tell us how much appreciation we're going to take every year. So that'd be 25,000. Or you could say 300 minus 50 and divide that by 20. We should get the same answer. That's it. Yeah, sorry. Tony was the last one. You should get the same answer. It's just two different ways to get there. Wait, you better divide by 20, you're not getting the same answer. No. You're not. You gotta use the years that are in the problem. Does that make sense? Yes. On a Friday? And we're not really with it. Okay. So units of activity, this one makes a lot of sense to me for like a manufacturing plant or something. It depreciates a piece of equipment based on how many units it produces. So it kind of, you know, you're, you're calculating the wear and tear and the loss of usefulness based on production, which kind of makes sense. Because if you're having a slow month or a slow year, you're not wearing that machine out as fast as you would otherwise be. So um, this is a good one for certain activities, you know. It's... Um, it can be hours of use, it can be miles driven for a vehicle, or it can be quantity produced if it's um, a machine producing a product. So in this case, your depreciation expense will be different every year. In straight line, it's going to be the same amount year after year. With units of uh, activity, you're going to have a different amount every year because you're basing it off of use. Hours of use, um, miles driven, how much is being produced, so it's going to vary. So just make sure you are aware that one's different every year and this one is going to be the same. Does it say that anywhere? Now I will qualify that statement there by saying um, unless you buy an asset on January 1st and you get rid of it on December 31st, the first year and the last year will probably not be the same as the other years because you're not going to be using it for a full year. I mean, rarely does a company buy something new on New Year's Day you know, and put it into operations. It's usually somewhere in the middle of the year. If you put it into um, if you buy a piece of equipment and put it into service in June, you're not going to take a whole year's worth of depreciation. You're only going to take the months that it's used. So the, that particular year, you'll have less. So um, just keep that tucked away. All right, so let's see what this one looks like. Um, so the first thing we have to do is determine the depreciation per unit. And we'll do that in a similar fashion so like on the top, we'll take our cost minus our residual value, but then we'll divide it instead of by the number of years or whatever, we'll divide it by the total estimated units of activity that it will ever have um, to get depreciation per unit. Um, then we'll take that depreciation per unit that we have calculated and multiply it by the actual units that were produced during that year. So let's kind of put it into play. So you've got equipment acquired at the beginning of the year. Cost was $160,000. It has an estimated residual of eight, meaning once they're done with it, it should still be worth $8,000. 
and what they're doing is they're not fully depreciating the asset there because once you fully depreciate something, its value becomes zero, book value. You might be able to sell it for more, but what it's worth on the books is zero. So they're leaving, um, they're trying to make it more realistic by um, anticipating what it'll be worth when they're finished with it. Because what happens is over years, you may have a piece of equipment that you're using to manufacture um, soft drinks or something. Well, I mean, it's going to work fantastic in the beginning, but the older it gets, you know, it's going to slow down. It's not going to be as good. It may be um, useful for somebody. Maybe it's starting out a new business or something like that. They, they may not um, mind it being a little bit slower since they can get something a little cheaper on the front end. So it'll be worth something to somebody, but to you, it's slowing down your process. So, you know, at this point, you're going to want to replace it to keep things moving fast. Does that make sense? Okay, so depreciable cost on this one. The cost is 160. The residual is $8,000. This, this is an estimate. Whenever they say residual value is this, it's always going to say estimated because there's no way they can have any clue five years from now what that's going to be worth. There's just no, they're just guessing. All right, so 152 is our depreciable cost. So now we've got to figure out how much our depreciation per unit is going to be. And this is similar to straight line, but instead of years, we're going to use hours. So we're going to take our um, $152,000 and we're going to divide it by this 40,000 hours. So that's going to give us how much per hour? So our depreciation rate is $3.80 per unit, which is an hour. Say hour. So unit. Our unit is an hour. So that's how much we're going to depreciate. For every hour this machine works, we'll depreciate $3.80. So for this particular year, we have 3,000 hours that it operated. So we'll take our 3,000 hours for this year, and we'll multiply it by that $3.80 per hour, and that will tell us how much depreciation we have. 11.4. Four. Okay, so our depreciation for the year is $11,400. Just a different way to do it. Sorry, it still cracks me up. You said that it's guessing. Oh, yeah. That means someone went to college, did all this work, and then gets paid. To guess. Literally, yeah. it's an point. educated guess. Yeah, yeah, it's an extra. That's what you call an educated guess. So you mean you mean like that? That's what that's what people in Congress do. In Congress? Yeah, I was gonna say they're like members of Congress. Gosh, that would be a whole different can of worms we'd be opening there. <laughs> educated guessing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not saying lots they're of all educated, obviously. Uh, yeah, educated, lots of stuff, arguing and everything <laughs> else. All right, so. Um, yeah, we'll call it that, too. Yeah, that, that's. I just, it was cracking me up. I was just like, that it's, can be it's literally show. someone gets paid to guess. That's, that's true. And I mean, honestly, managers, when they're doing a lot of their projections and stuff like that, it's all guessing, but it's educated guessing based on statistics and analysis and. So, yeah, I mean, still guessing. it's still guessing, yeah. But, um, I mean, there's unless you're a fortune teller and you've got a crystal ball, there's no way you can accurately, you know, say what things are going to be doing. In fact, even if you were, like, super good at that kind of stuff, it's so subject to change. Theoretically, we can design computers that can do that. Yeah, and they do. No, I mean, you can design computers to, like, Accurately predict the future. If yeah. You could, if you could input enough variables. That's of course, true. the amount of data that you would need to do that with uh, the trillions of uh, terabytes of data. Yeah. So, hmm. Probably not worth the time right now. No. All right. So here's a, another example of this um, uh, units. What do we call that? I just kind of went blank. <laughs> units of activity. All right, so let's look at another example. We have a truck that was acquired at $80,000. That was the cost. So acquired means they purchased it, they got it, 
and it cost them $80,000. Estimated residual is $16,000. So the amount that we are going to depreciate is $64,000. That's our depreciable cost. Okay, so if we take our depreciable cost and we divide it by the total number of hours that they anticipate, oh, this is miles. Um, that's this year. This is what they expect. This is a truck. They expect it to be useful for 300,000 miles. So we're going to divide our cost by 300,000 miles to see how much we are going to depreciate for every mile that truck is driven. So 64,000 divided by 300,000. It's going to be in the pennies, isn't it? Um, three. So it was like 0.213 repeating. Yeah, so we'll just say 0.213. Just to be the most. Or 21 cents, whatever. Yeah, um, that would be accurate. Any gas station would go to the 10th of the cent. So yeah, um, and if you don't pick up that little piece, then you'll end up with extra on the back end. So, um, yep. okay, so we've got how many miles they drove this year was 65,000 miles. I left the bigger space for the bigger words. Times 21.3 cents per mile. So how much is depreciation for this year? 13,845 is the depreciation. Does that make sense to y'all what we're doing? I don't know that I've ever seen somebody do depreciation on a truck like that, but for like a like a big rig or something, they might do that because I don't know that they get a lot more than 300,000 miles out of those. No, I don't know. Big rigs. That sounds more like a pickup. You can get lots and lots and lots of miles out of it. I don't know how many, but I'll be impressed that if uh, vehicles today can get 300,000 miles. What kind? Any, yeah, any, any vehicles? It depends. Um, I've seen, I've known people that have gotten more than that out of like their. I think older ones, sure. Like any, anything before like 2010, I think. That's mm. very, very reasonable to assume. But. I had a friend that got. More than 300 out of her Camry. I think she got 350 out of it. What year was it? I don't even remember. Probably before 2010. Yeah. I was going to say, no, no, I don't even want Toyota. Toyota stuff. Yeah, and that's why I'm driving a Honda because it's not on wood. It'll last me a while. But I've already had to replace a couple of things and it's got 75,000 miles on it. So I'm kind of like, hmm. A little, dis Engineer. Yeah, <laughs> a little disappointed about that. <laughs> But fortunately, I had a. Um, we call it the the hundred thousand mile return because you know, like once you're like hundred thousand miles, like well, I'm not even there yet. Like, I've already had to replace the starter on it. Oh, well, that's. I mean, yeah. electronic equipment will fail. I know, because but that's just already. I mean, I had to replace the battery, which is no brainer, but it actually made it longer than I think it was the original battery, and I just replaced it, so that's pretty good. Um, I was I was impressed it lasted as long as it did. Stuff like that, I don't mind. But in the window, something went wacky with my window. It would and wouldn't roll down at different times. It was kind of well, what I hate is when it rolls down and you can't get it back. <laughs> that takes me back to the old days in my first car when my power windows were like this. You just rolled them up with that little. Y'all even seen this? <laughs> you probably have. The manual windows. Oh, manual. I never had any trouble, but I had a two-door car, so you could reach over and lock them. That was my power locks, and that was my power windows. <laughs> but I didn't have any trouble with it. They didn't break. Other stuff broke, but not that. It sounded like. Um, yeah, but it sounded fuel, like a your fuel pump would go out every like. Oh man, trying to start in the winter with those fuel the fuel pumps. Well, it was an eighty-one. Yeah, starting in the winter with a carburetor. Is that a carburetor? I think so. Yeah. Oh my god. Yep. Winter, winter was awful. I guarantee. It was. Um, it actually cranked okay. I mean, I think sometimes it would kind of cough, spit a little bit. My brother had a um, RX7. It had a choke on it. Yeah. That was funny. I was like, "What are you doing with it? You pull it out in the winter times. So it makes the car crank." 
you know, those were simpler days. You could actually pop the hood and find the dipstick to check your oil like relatively quickly. I can find my dipstick. Well, I can too, but I'm just saying there wasn't right the there wasn't so know. much stuff in there, you know. And it's like yeah, these most days, of the engine block is covered now because there's a bunch of electronics on top. Yeah, and the way that where the battery is, like mine, I can find fine. It's no problem. I can jump mine off. But like, um, I had a Camaro, and it's like I've changed one in the Corvette. It's the battery very, was under the back seat, I think, in my Camaro, but that had the contacts up under the hood. So it's like, I just like to know where everything is if I get in trouble so I can like do something about it. No, it was like a newer, like it was like a 2013, 2014 Corvette this guy brought in and it, it was buried in the trunk and it was like a <clears throat> massive. My battery. brother had um, a BMW just, and he was out of pocket for several months and I tried to drive it occasionally just to keep it from dying and it sat for a while and the battery went dead and we couldn't get we did get it charged up to get it to the shop but it literally took about half an hour to get enough charge on that battery to get it cranked and I never could find the battery I knew where it was generally and when they did shut it was huge it was like a two hundred dollar battery, huge, and I was like, I don't want one of these. I want something I can go to O'Reilly's and buy me a battery. Although O'Reilly's wouldn't change my battery because it was under electronics, so I just took it to the home. No, yeah, certain certain ones. Like, I took like it to the dealership and they it. changed it for the same price. It's like just please fix it. So, first world problems. Um, Appreciation. That's a first world. Problem. Yes, it is. What's funny about this is this is a business expense. This is something that you take as a business to get the benefit. I'm saying benefit from the aspect of it being a tax write-off mm -hmm. for a purchase you've made. And I actually had a car dealer try to explain to me how depreciation was going to benefit me. <laughs> I started laughing at him. I said, this is a personal vehicle. I'm not sure how depreciation is going to benefit me. And he and I was about 22, 23. I was just out of school, but um, I was 23, 24. That's it. I'm trying to buy this car, and he, you know they're trying to schmooze me because I'm a young girl. And I'm just looking like you're like. I'm what you been smoking? I'm he goes, I know how depreciation works. Well, I know. Work. I mean, I had a navy suit on and everything. Back in the days, we 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 were we didn't wear pants to work as ladies. We wore we had to wear skirts and heels and hose and. So I've come after work, and he's like, oh, you're going to counter, aren't you? I said, yes. Try a different angle. <laughs> Jerk. Made me so mad. I was like, and you can be gone, and I'll talk to these other people. I'm going to talk to someone that <laughs> You can to sell disappear. Me well, he wanted to sell it to me. He just wanted to uh, pull one, put one over me. On me, yeah, be dishonest about it, which, anyway. All right, so double declining balance method. That provides a declining periodic expense over the expected useful life of the asset. So a greater amount of the depreciation is taken in the beginning of the asset's life when it's producing more. This is um, going to be close to tax methods. Um, the, there are book methods. There are tax methods. A lot of times you'll see accountants use tax methods for the books just to make it simpler um but you know larger companies that have financial statements and they do their you know, obviously do their tax returns they may have a different method they use for the for the financial statements and a different method for the tax returns but this is the this is similar to what in fact it's the same thing double declining balance is what tax methods are set up like <clears throat> All right, so first thing we have to do is figure out what is our straight line percentage. We've already done that. You know, you take the 100% divided by the useful life. We do that in the first method. So once we do that, then we'll determine the double declining balance rate by multiplying that rate we calculated in one by two. <clears throat> and so we'll compute the depreciation expense by multiplying that rate from step two times the book value of the asset. Okay, so this has got a whole lot of pieces in it. So let's kind of go through it. Book value, remember, is 
Y'all remember this? Asset cost minus cumulative, cumulated depreciation is your book value. <clears throat> All right, so note, when double declining balance method is used, estimated residual value is not considered. However, when you're depreciating an asset, you should not depreciate it below that estimated residual value. So once your accumulated depreciation has reached the amount that if you depreciate it anymore, it's going to dip below what you've estimated for the residual value, you've got to stop. You'll be done. All right, so let's see what this looks like. Equipment acquired at the beginning of the year at a cost of $200,000 has an estimated residual value of 20 and an estimated useful life of 10. So determine first the double declining balance rate and then we'll figure the depreciation for the first year. All right, so the rate. We, this is our, um, our straight line rate that we're going to calculate first. S slash L is straight line. So 100% divided by 10 years gives us 10%. Right? Yes? No? I hope so. Our double declining balance rate would be 10% times 2. Oops, I'm to put it in dollars. Percentage. 20%. So our depreciation expense would be, all right, our book value on our first year is going to be $200,000. We don't have any accumulated to take away from it. So remember, um, so depreciation expense, we're going to take our rate that we just calculated times our book value, where book value is cost minus accumulated. Well, we hadn't even depreciated anything yet, so our cost in our book value is the same amount here. So we'll multiply this 200,000 times 20%, and that's going to give us what our depreciation expense should be. So 40,000. That's our depreciation expense for the first year. So really, I mean, what you're doing in each one of these is you're just taking the information and plug it into, plugging it into the formulas. It's not really hard. All right, so let's work another one. Building acquired. At the beginning of the year, 1,500,000 has an estimated residual of 320, estimated useful life of 40. All right, so let's see what our straight line rate is going to be first, and then we'll double it. So it's going to be 100% divided by 40 years. So what percentage is that going to be? 2.5%. Okay, so 2.5%, and that makes a lot of sense. I think about these things as I'm um, thinking back to the days when I did tax work, which was not that long ago, and they had um, charts you could look at that had the different percentages for the particular years, but we have software that does this. So 5% so will be our first year rate under double declining balance. Okay. So our depreciation expense will be, we're using a million five because we don't have any accumulated at this point. One million five times 5%. So that will be 75,000? I'm a little impressed. You're impressed? I'm a little bit impressed. <laughs> I'm doing that in my head. I was like, 5%. It was impressive to me when I started to learn it because I'm so used to using a 10 key. Yeah, Working like in an I, office, I never calculated anything in my head. I had to get to where I was doing some of it here because it's taken too long on some of it. It gets too, if it's nice and round, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so here's just a, a little summary out of your book of these methods. Okay, so on a straight line method, your useful life is going to be years. The cost that you're going to use to calculate depreciation is your cost minus your residual value. Your rate is a straight line rate, and your depreciation expense is constant. That means it's going to be the same amount every year. Okay, units of activity. The useful life is going to be how many total units of activity that asset will is expected to have over its entire life. Cost minus residual is what you're going to depreciate. And then the rate will be cost minus residual divided by the total units of activity you ever expect that 
asset to produce. So the depreciation expense is going to be variable. It's going to change every year based on how many units of activity you've got. Double declining balance, we're using years for a useful life. The cost is a declining book value, but not below residual. And the rate is that straight line rate times two, and your depreciation expense is going to get smaller every year. So let's just kind of, just for the heck of it, look at this. Um, so this is year one, right? This would be year one. So if we were calculating year two, we would take, um, we've got our rate, but we take a million five hundred thousand and we subtract out that 75 we already took in depreciation, that would be our accumulated. So we would have 1,425,000 that we would multiply by 5% and that would be our second year depreciation. Y'all see how that works? And every year you do the same thing. You reduce it by the accumulated and then depreciate what's left by 5%. Does that make sense? Yeah. Y'all on? Okay, so we're gonna <laughs> we're done for the day. Um, we're gonna stop here. We'll pick up again on Monday. Um, again, all the parts of the SLO problem will be due next Friday. I'll adjust those dates in Canvas, and you can start um, picking those. Up. You can pick those up today if you want to. Parts two and three, or I'll give them to you Monday. So that's your call. Um, but everybody have a good weekend. <laughs> you got to work? No, that's good. I'm going to.